I'm, I'm like a Turk in Turkey. Um, well, first of all, thanks for Hans having me here again, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you, uh, to reconnect with the liberal, liberal libertarian ideas every year, like in this wonderful place. Um, uh, I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to speak about how the Ottoman Empire and its transformation into modern nation states influenced the Middle East uh, and why it might not be a great thing, you know, at least it's, 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 it's debatable. But before that, I would like to touch upon uh, Dr. Stone's, Professor Stone's uh, speech. Uh, like, I, I'm a fan of Dr. Stone and his work, and you know, I very much agree with what he said about uh, Turkish uh, society and culture and history. And one thing I would like to emphasize probably on that, or like at, at, a, at, a, at an angle, is that I think Turks have been struggling to understand uh, whether westernization and modernization are the same things. Uh, I think the Kemalist revolution basically was the idea that you need to modernize and modernization means you have to westernize. Uh, so you have to get rid of your traditional culture. That was one model. And the people who objected that, objected at, uh, that model in Turkey, which partly includes me, uh, are not necessarily anti-modern, a few people would be anti-modern, total traditionalist in Turkey. But they said, well, we will modernize, but modernization doesn't equal westernization. So it means you don't have to listen to Mozart, but you, know, but you should get more technology and make more music, you know, your music better, or you can have your Bollywood, as the you know, Indians do, but you don't have to be the exact replica of Hollywood. It's a different, so you can modernize within your culture retaining your values. Of course, you'll change some things in your culture. Uh, but but the, the idea in Turkey, especially the Kemalist idea, that you have to be like the West exactly. And that's, that's why we had like excessive of that, excesses of that revolution, like the famous hat revolution of 1925. You know, bowler hat was made compulsory. Uh, and, and the fez was banned. So the idea was by wearing bold, the brimmed hat, you know, we would be modern. But, you know, I think, uh, on the other hand, the other camp, the political camp in Turkey, which ultimately the AKP is tied to, says, no, we will not change our hats or you know, we will not change our fez, but we want railroads and telegraph and, and, and now internet and, and, you know, construction and we, we'll build our country, you know, we need education and so on, but there's a distinction between that, and, I think, in the Turkish political sphere. And Turkey has been this... Uh, is a like a I think a case study an like experiment in which these two forms of modernization, these two visions of modernization, have you know struggled throughout the 20th century. And I say now I think the conservative side has been more dominant you know, lately uh, in Turkey. The 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 the, the, mod the 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 side which views modernization something that you can do within your own culture. Well, anyway, that's a that's another you know philosophical or like a political uh, discussion. Uh, today, my talk, uh, which actually Hans you know, brought to discussion a few months ago brilliantly, uh, is the transition from the Ottoman Empire to the modern Middle East. Uh, and I would like to begin with a map we have, I think, that like technology right now. So this, well, what you see here is, well, the Ottoman Empire was a big place, and this is what was the Ottoman Empire in its largest form, like a broad map. What we call today North Africa, uh, the Arabic Middle East, uh, and the Balkans was the Ottoman Empire until, well, this is the, the empire in its largest form in the 17th century, and the empire lost its Balkan states gradually uh, from the uh, 18th century onwards, but the Arab provinces remained as a part of the empire well into early 20th century, and when the empire fell in World War I, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and during the process which led to that destruction, uh, some 26 nation states emerged from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they, and all the countries we're speaking about in, in the Middle East right now, like Egypt, Tunis, Algeria, Libya, uh, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, these were all were the Ottoman Empire. It was based in Istanbul, of course, and uh, like it was one of the like it's, it lasts for six centuries. One of the big political phenomena, you know, in world history. And of course, we 
as the products or as the children of the modern age, we always assume, or not we, but we are taught to assume that the age of empires was like a black, dark age, and with the rise of modern nation states, everything got better. It's not a, I mean, it's, it's a debatable uh, presupposition. It's a debatable idea. So I'll try to you know, bring that a little bit to the discussion today. Uh, what, what happened is that when the, when the empire fell, all these nation states emerged and they were modern and they defined themselves in a national way. But there was a, there was a problem with identity with all those states. Because in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, the, the political structure was by definition multi-ethnic and multi-religious. In other words, there was not a Ottomanness that conflicted with your Turkishness or your Kurdishness or your Jewishness or your Armenianness. You could be an Ottoman Armenian, you could be an Ottoman Turk, you could be an Ottoman Arab, you could be an Ottoman Albanian. Uh, in the pre-modern era, before the 19th century, this was secured by the Islamic system of Zimmis, which protected people. In which the Muslims were superior, Jews and Christians were given protected status, not equal but second class you know, protected status. But in the 19th century, even that was you know, reformed, and the Ottoman Empire accepted the idea of equal citizenship for Christians and Jews in the middle of 19th century with the Islahat reform of uh, 1856. It began with the Tanzimat reforms of uh, 1839, but in 1856, the Sultan declared all citizens are equal and you know, they are, you know, they're all Osmanli, they're all Ottoman. Uh, that's why the Ottoman Empire employed large numbers of Armenians or Jews or Greeks in Ottoman bureaucracy in, in the 19th century, in the late 19th century. And when the Ottoman Parliament was opened in 18, uh, 1876, there were a large number of Jewish, Armenian, or Greek, or you know, some other non-Muslim community, representatives of, of those non-Muslim communities. Uh, and in the Ottoman Constitution of 18. Uh, 76, Kanuni Asasi, the fundamental law, because I mean the Ottoman was a monarchy, but it became a constitutional monarchy with that law. Uh, it's uh, the, one of the clauses state all citizens are called Osmanli Ottoman, regardless of race and creed. Again, you could be a Jewish Ottoman, you could be an Ottoman you know, Turk, you could be an Ottoman Armenian. But in the new states, this thing, this this pluralism, got. Uh, challenge. And let's see the next map, please. Sorry, it's a complicated. I, I was. I'm not really good with the technology, so I'm not, not modern enough yet. So Turkey is maybe doing good. <laughs> okay, this is the modern Middle East in which we have all these nation states, uh, and Turkey is only one of them. And you know, there are more, some 20 more of these nation states. Uh, but the, the borders of these states were not drawn according to some you know, natural border. I mean, the border between Syria and Iraq, as you can see, drawn by like, straight, straight lines, or just they were drawn not based on the realities on the ground. They were not drawn according to other provinces, because the Ottoman Empire had a system of provinces. So for example, the, the country that we call Iraq was actually three provinces, Basra, Mosul, and Baghdad. Uh, and, but the Musul province was going a little further north, uh, and uh, for example, this, in Syria, it was like the, Damascus was a province. And these were, th there were no borders between these countries. So for, an, uh, for like a villager in 1920, who was living in what became the Turkish-Iraqi border, uh, there was no concept of a border before. So these borders were drawn by mostly, well, by, by treaties, by, by the French and the British who decided to colonize the Middle East. And it was actually decided in a famous agreement by the British and the French called the Sykes Pico Agreement of 1916. Can we check the next slide, please? Uh, yeah, this shows the French and the British zone of influence. Uh, the, the blue part is the French influence, which ultimately became Syria and, and Lebanon. And the, uh, the pink and the red one ultimately became Iraq and Transjordan, which became Jordan, and also, of course, Israel there as well, Israel-Palestine. Uh, so these countries just sat down basically on a map, discussed, you know, this should be the country, that should be the country. So created these countries called Iraq or Syria. There were historical regions there, 
but they, they were not separate countries. So then, in just a few decades, what you had was that b before you would have a country called the Ottoman Empire from, which, from, from one end to the other end, you could just go without any border, then you had these very well-defined borders. Uh, and actually, there's a funny movie about this uh, by a Turkish director, Sinan Çetin, called Propaganda. And it was actually shown here a few years ago. Uh, it's a story of a, Tur of a village in southeastern Turkey, probably a Kurdish village. Uh, and like one day, some in, 90, in the early 1920s, a, a delegation from Ankara, the new Turkish capital, comes with you know, their I mean, like marches and so on. And they say, we brought you a border. And they say, they, the villagers say, what is a border? Like, it's just this barbed wire which will protect you from your enemies. And they say, we have no enemies. Like, this, which, the next village is that they're talking about, like, it's their relatives. So, the, the whole, like, so, and the borders actually were created, and even not just barbed wire, but landmines were later planted. So, today, still between Turkey and Syria, there's a border with landmines and, you know, barbed wire on both sides. And the people on both sides of the border are basically the same ethnic and you know, religious groups. They're relatives. They want to see each other, actually. Turkey recently began an open border policy, you know, allowed visa-free travel, and that's a good thing, and I'll come back to that. But until today, these, these societies, which actually were the same society, were actually divided artificially between, by these nation states. Um, now, but having a border is not just enough. Uh, if you are a nation state, you also want to, I mean, having a border gives you idea of a tidy country. You can well define it, you know, you know where it ends and, it ends and it begins. But you also want to have a well-defined society. You want to have a nation. Uh, again, that is the new idea of, which began with the French Revolution and which actually created, uh, killed the Ottoman Empire. Was, I mean, the Ottoman Empire lagged behind the West in terms of technology and military skills and so on, definitely. But what really killed the empire was nationalism. Because after the French Revolution, this idea that a, an, an ethnic group should become a nation and should have its own state became a fashionable idea. And it began in the Balkans with revol revolts against the empire, the Greeks, the Serbs, and the Bulgarians. And these uh, moments of national liberation are often you know, praised as moments of freedom for those countries. Um, in one sense it was, because I mean, some considered the Ottoman rule as an Ottoman yoke. Uh, and you know, that's, I think, it's relativistic when you look at it from a uh, like historical perspective. Uh, but Creating a nation state also created uh, the, the zeal to make that nation homogeneous. Uh, that's, that, there was a famous slogan in the Balkans, Serbia uh, is for the Serbs, Greece is for the Greeks, and Bulgaria is for the Bulgarians. Which meant the non-Serbian, the non-Bulgarian, or the non-Greek people would become a problem and they would be forced to migrate. Or they could remain and become a, you know, under, like a, like a, a, a community discriminated against, or they could, they were, in many cases, they were forced to migrate, there were ethnic cleansings. That's why in the Ottoman psyche, the idea of a national liberation within the empire is connected with the killing and the slaughter and the expulsion of the Turks. Because throughout, in, throughout the 19th century, when there was a national liberation movement in Serbia, uh, Sir, Turks or Muslims who were also considered as Turks, uh, even uh, they are non-Turkish, were seen by the Serbs as the enemy. So they came back, they fled to Istanbul, and you know, and, and Turks saw these like refugees coming from there, and th that fear of an enemy within which will create its own territory and then will exterminate your people is the background of the decision to expel the Armenians. That disastrous decision in 1915 to expel the Armenians from Anatolia because when the Ottomans in war, were war in 1915 uh, and, and Russians supported the Armenian insurgency and some Armenians revolted against the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans then thought, the Ottoman government of the time, the Young Turk government, they had internalized the nationalism you know, of, the, of the era and they said, now we will do it first. And unfortunately it was a horrific disaster, I'm not like, supportive of that decision and uh, hundreds of thousands of Armenians perished. Uh, but the blame was, I think, this 
the whole era and the whole spirit of creating these nation states, homogeneous nation states. And I think none of the countries or none of the societies at that era is totally immune from that, I think, problem. Uh, and some, some of the uh, countries were homogenized by ethnic cleansings, uh, expulsions. There were more civilized means that we call population exchange. Uh, and Turkey did that with Greece uh, right after establishing the Republic in 1923. Actually, even before the Republic in 1922, there, there were many Greek citizens. There were many Greeks in Turkey who spoke Greek. There were Ottoman citizens before. Now they would be. They would have been Turkish citizens. And there were many Turks living in uh, in Greece. Uh, and the two countries decided to have a population exchange in which Turks just. Uh, Turkey told its Greek uh, citizens to leave the country overnight and you know, they were put on ships and sent to Greece and the Turks living in uh, Greece were similarly sent uh, to Turkey. Uh, some people were left and especially the Greeks in Istanbul were exempted from that and the Turks in Western Thrace, some, a particular part of Greece, was, were exempted. Still we have those as minorities, both countries. Um, but the, the, the pro the, one of the tragedies is that those people were seen as aliens before they immigrated. Uh, they were seen as aliens in where they went as well. So for the, for the Greeks, the newcomers were the Turkish Greeks, which they didn't fully like and didn't see as fully Greek. And the same thing happened in Turkey, where the newcomers were seen as the, the, the Turks of Greece, which were not, again, the same people. So this effort to create these homogenous societies create a lot of trauma in the lives of these peoples uh, and all across the region. A particularly telltale example is the situation of the Kurds. I mean, Dr. Stone referred to uh, Kurds in a brilliant way. I mean, how the Spanish have a problem with the, uh, with the Basques or the Basque have a problem with the Spanish. Uh, maybe one difference is that, I mean, the Kurds are also underprivileged part of Turkish society, where the Basque region is not a, like a poor society, part of uh, Spain. Uh, but the Kurdish story is very interesting because it tells us, it shows us an important case study of this transformation between the empire and to the nation state and how it created an important uh, trouble. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here is a map showing uh, Kurds as a people. This uh, you know, dark color, the Arbaker is one of the important uh, Kurdish dominated cities in Turkey, uh, like overwhelming the Kurdish cities. As you can see, the Kurds as a people are scattered uh, in a large geography, which is covered by Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Now, in the Ottoman Empire, there was not a Kurdish issue, uh, because the Ottoman Empire was not a Turkish state. Uh, so Kurds were just one of the peoples of the empire, which were not, you know, inspired by the ideas of modern nation states. So you don't have nationalist Kurdish rebellions against the Ottoman Empire. There was some reaction to centraliz centralization in the 19th century. So there were some extra taxes and some Kurdish lo local chieftains didn't want to pay taxes. There were some problems with that. But there was no Kurdish nationalist uprising. Uh, but in the 20th century, when the Middle East was divided between Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, uh, and when these countries wanted to define their notion of citizenship, a problem began, especially in Turkey, uh, because Turkey is the country in the Middle East which is most modernized, but also it is, it is also the country which went to the most extremes in terms of homogenizing its population, or at least trying to homogenize its population. Uh, and you can see this, this transition in the Turkish you know, definition of citizenship clearly. In the Ottoman constitution, as I said, it said all Ottoman citizens are called Ottomans, regardless of you know, race and creed. In the constitution of 1921, when the, uh, when the Turkish parliament, the war parliament, did you know, hastily uh, in, the, in the time of war, but there were also Kurdish deputies, it said, it didn't define any citizenship, and it said republic. It said the state of Turkey, state of Turkey, not the Turkish state, but the state of Turkey. In 1924, though, once the war was won, because the war was a war of the Turks and the Kurds together against the occupying powers, 
the definition of citizenship changed and it said every citizen of Turkey is called a Turk. Uh, and in the constitution of 1961, which the generals drafted, and in the constitution of 1982, which the generals drafted again after their military coups, because in Turkey the military does a coup once in a while, you know, when they, when they put the board in their barracks. Um, they're not doing it anymore, but you know, that was the case until recently. Uh, and they drafted these coups. It says every citizen of Turkey is a Turk. That's a constitutional uh, clause of Turkey. But Kurds don't think that they are Turks. Uh, and once you define Turkey as a Turkish state, then the minorities, like the Kurds, have a problem. And that's why the, the Turkish Republic had its major you know, uprising in 1925, right after the constitution of 1924, in which a, a, a a Kurdish group led by an Islamic leader, like a sheikh, uh, revolted against the republic, and you know there was a big uh, clash between the military and that group, and that was suppressed, you know, quite brutally. And then from that point on, from 1925 to today, there has been more than two dozen Kurdish rebellions in Turkey, uh, and the Kurds rebelled because they did not, uh, they wanted to be defined as Kurds, and they did not except being Turkified, and in the face of that, the state intensified its effort to make them more Turkish. So there is a famous motto of Atatürk that every Turkish knows, and it's in, written in every wall, and it says, ne mutlu Türküm diyene, which means, how happy is the one who says, I am a Turk. Uh, so the, and it's a different concept than, the, for example, US, uh, the founding of US. In the United States, you know, there's the idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So there's the idea that you will pursue your own happiness. Here in Turkey, the state tells you how you will be happy. You will be happy by being a Turk. Uh, and the funny thing is, I mean, it's about happiness, but the first time I went to Diyarbakir, the biggest Kurdish city in Turkey, well, now the biggest Kurdish city is in Istanbul, that's a different story, but uh, the, the traditional biggest Kurdish city. In, in Diyarbakir, there's this military garrison in the middle of the city, which is protected by like watchtowers and machine guns and so on. And one, in one of the walls of the, uh, the garrison, it says, how happy is the one who says I'm a Turk? Then there is a high, very high barbed, barbed wire uh, wall to prote protect that uh, writing from the citizens of the city, from the, who are not Turkish and who are not really not happy being by defense. So this making people Turkish has been the un, like amazing policy of the Turkish Republic for decades. And it is like engraved in every official uh, text. For example, every Turkish student when they go to school uh, from like from the beginning from age 7 to uh, 17 to the end of high school, you have to take an oath every morning. And the oath starts by saying I'm Turkish, I'm righteous, I'm hardworking. Then it goes on and you say, uh, you say, oh mighty Ataturk, who has given us this day, we will relentlessly walk on your path. Then you do the Kemalism thing. And at the end of the oath you say, let my existence be a gift to Turkish existence. So there are two problems there, I think, from my point of view. First of all, the individual is you know, sacrificed for, for the collective. That's one problem. I mean, I'm a Turk, but I don't want to sacrifice my existence to Turkish existence. I mean, I respect Turkish existence, but you know, I, I can sacrifice or not sacrifice it. It's my choice. You know, um, That's one problem. The other problem is some people are not even Turkish in this country. They're, they're, they, why would they sacrifice their existence to... I mean, I would not sacrifice my existence to, with all due respect, to Scottish existence, for example. I mean, I'm not Scottish. I respect them. Very much. Why would people do that? So Turkey has struggled intensely uh, with this problem. And for decades and decades, the state did not accept that there are Kurds. It was actually illegal to say that there are Kurds in Turkey. In 1982, I mean, this was the paradigm created under Kemalist you know, period from 1925 to 1950, when Turkey was a single party regime. So the, only, the only party was the Kemalist party, and it was running the whole system. They installed this you know, cult of Turkishness. And, uh, and that everybody, the idea that everybody is Turkish. Uh, and then after that period, you know, there were times of 
you know, little softening because elected governments came to power, they decreased some of the, you know, uh, hawkishness of the regime. But then the military would come and restore, you know, the regime and, and also be focusing on the Kurdish question. So, for example, the, mil uh, the military uh, government of 1982 imprisoned Sheraf Eddin Elchi, a politician in Turkey, uh, for saying, I am a Kurd and there are Kurds in Turkey. That was separatist propaganda, so he was imprisoned for that. So until 1990s, it was illegal to say, you know, that there are Kurds in Turkey, legal to speak Kurdish, because there was a law saying that any language other than Turkish cannot be spoken. Well, English is fine, that modernizes us, French is fine, but local languages other than Turkish could not be spoken. Now, none of this, of course, I should say, justifies the brutality of the Kurdish insurgencies, I mean, including the PKK. So, I mean, they reacted to this oppression, but they created their own very oppressive movements in which attacked civilians and, and made, killed many people in Turkey. But the insurgency between the state and the PKK uh, created uh, like a huge death toll. The, the, the number of casualties between, uh, as a result of the war between the PKK and the, and the security forces is 40,000 people. Uh, in 20 years. This is like 10 times more than the, the death toll of the, uh, the conflict between the IRA and, and the British government. It's a huge death toll. And where Turkey will head from that is still unknown. There was a bomb you know, uh, in Istanbul two days ago. I mean, Istanbul is a safe, nice place generally, I mean, if you want to go, but you know, occasionally, even in Istanbul, they can make, a, they can make an attack. Uh, and of course, the conflict is mostly going on in the southeast. And right now, uh, to and this is just one of the conflicts which arose from the legacy of the idea of these nation states in the Middle East. If you go to Syria, well, you will see there's a different structure there. In Syria, in Turkey, there's this majoritarian, major, major, majority you know, rule on the Kurds, and Kurds as a minority feel oppressed. If you go to Syria, there's a minority rule. The minority, uh, Alevite minority, which rules the country because the French left them behind, uh, has a, like like a domination over the Sunni majority, and you know the Sunni majority is revolting these days, and you know the, the, the people of Assad are shoot, shooting them for you know protesting against the regime. If you go to Iraq, you will see a different sta status. Like in Iraq, the Sunnis used to be the dominant uh, class, whereas the Shiite majority, which makes this makes per, six, almost 60% of the population was marginalized. Now they have a comeback, and then after the fall of Saddam, now Iraq is trying to uh, create a, a, like a system in which this, neither the Shiite nor the Sunnis will be you know, marginalized. And of course, there's a Kurdish element in, in Iraq as well. Uh, if you go to Le Lebanon, you will see a very different system. You, you have even more groups, and they're trying to you know, maintain a political system after a bloody you know, civil war. Uh, if you go to like Gulf states, you will see Sunni majorities oppressing some Shia groups, and, uh, and Shia is always seen as a problem. So, this is the, the states, which are basically legacies of the colonial rule, uh, and and the political structures which are legacies of the colonial rule. Because in most countries, as I said, when the British or the French were leaving, they left behind something. It was sometimes good. I mean, they left a good education system or nice railways. I mean, colonialism might, has its actually contributions, to be honest, to this part of the world. But it also, it was a doomed legacy in the sense that uh, it, it left a particular group that the French or the British uh, decided to work with as the dominant group. Or, in some cases, you had like uh, independence movements which fought against the British or the French or the Italians in, in North Africa. Uh, and then those groups becoming you know, authoritarian with themselves. So, what to, what to do in a region like this? Like, will this region be like this always, and will there be ever peace of mind? Well, there are theories about how a better Middle East can be. And here is a theory, a particular theory which, which I don't like, but, you know, it's, it's an uh, alternative. Can we please sh check the next slide? This is a suggestion by a U.S. Uh, colonel uh, published in a U.S. military magazine, and he says, this can be a better Middle East, if we can create a group for every ethnic group, a state for every ethnic group, it will be better, he says. For example, then Turkey would be divided, there would be a free Kurdistan, Syria stays there, Iraq is divided between a Sunni Iraq and Arab Shia state, there's a greater Jordan, I mean Israel's back in 367, that's a good idea, but you know, that sort of thing. 
There's a Medina and Saudi Arabia is divided. You know, everything is divided. So the idea is that there are ethnic groups which don't have their estates. So let's give them more states. So let's create a, let's just continue the tide. I mean, it began with the fall of the empire in like Balkans and with the Serbian revolt. Let's go on more. So let's give the Kurds another state. But when you do this, you will have other problems. For example, among the people whom we call the called Kurds, there's another group called Zaza. And Zaza says, no, we are not Kurdish, the Kurds want to assimilate us. So will we create a Zazaistan among Kurdistan? Uh, and every, in every region that you, that you define by a majority, there's always a minority. Among the Kurdish parts of Turkey, within the Kurdish parts, there are some Turkish ethnic groups. And Kurds live not just in historical Kurdish areas, as I said, they live in you know, Istanbul as well. So there is actually no way that you can really give every ethnic group a state and think that this will be a wonderful place. And now, the alternative idea, in which I would, be, first of all, there's no good idea around, but the, the probably better alternative is not to just create more and more states, which will probably fight with each other and turn into Spartas in themselves, like war machines. Uh, and which will you know, try to create their own homogeneous societies. Instead of doing that, let's just accept the status quo, let's just try to diminish the role of these states, decentralize them, and like, let's get rid of the borders between them as much as we can. Let's just, instead of maximizing the state system, let's minimize it. Let's just make the state system less dominant on our you know, social reality. And actually, that's an idea that is being promoted right now by the Turkish government, Turkish uh, Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu. Uh, now, Turkey is defined by Erdogan in, in the past. I guess it's like Erdogan, everybody knows him. He's our you know, strong prime minister, sometimes a little angry, sometimes too angry prime minister. Uh, but Turkish Foreign Minister Davutoglu is also an important man in terms of shaping Turkish vision. He, he is the brain behind Turkish foreign policy. And from the first day on, he was criticizing this, you know, uh, this divisions in the Middle East, artificial divisions, and he says we have to get rid of them. How do we get rid of them? Well, you cannot abolish states, you know, uh, in one day at least. But his vision was, he said, let's get rid of these borders in the sense of let's let's promote free trade, let's open uh, all the borders, and people should be able to travel. Let's promote free travel. That's why Turkey now abolished its visa system with Syria or uh, Jordan or uh, like Beirut. So you can, without a visa, people can travel now between those countries. Uh, Turkey began to promote something like a primitive EU in the region in the sense that countries you know, can have, have more ties. And in one of his speeches, uh, Davutoglu said, the, uh, your, the, the, your security, the security of your country is not based on the number of tanks in your border, but on the number of trade agreements you, wait with, you make with your neighbor. The more you trade, have trade with them, you will, the more you understand that you're interdependent, and you will, the more you will want them to flourish, and, and you know, yourself will flourish. So I think that that's a better vision for this part of the world, and maybe the whole world, but especially in the Middle East, the societies in this region already have these historical contexts, and they, they already have a historical culture connection. And opening up, opening them up will allow them, I think, to uh, create a more liberal state within themselves. And how many minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. Another thing I think which we should add upon this is the, uh, the promises of the Arab Spring. You know, the, uh, as lately we were watching that, I mean, it began in Tunis and you know, moved on to Egypt and in Libya and in Syria, it became much more you know, dramatic. In Libya, it turned into a civil war. But basically, there was a there was a uh, there was a prejudice in the West. Uh, many people were looking in the Middle East, and they were saying, "Oh, this country, this region is full of dictatorships. So probably the Arabs love dictatorships. You know, why would otherwise all those countries uh, are illiberal, you know, strong uh, states uh, which oppress their people?" Uh, well, people actually don't play dictatorships. I mean, the, the, the reason why there are authoritarian strong states in the region was not because you know majority of the societies favored them, but because it was the legacy of a you know, doomed uh, 
like doomed political structure. It began with the fall of the empire, and it, it, it has historical roots. I mean, it goes back to like a feudalism in the in this part of the world. You know, that there are historical reasons for it, but also th that was also the fact that some of the Western countries, especially the United States, for a long time preferred dictators to <laughs> more liberal regimes because dictators were the one who were you know helping the U.S. in terms of foreign policy with like oil contracts or you know making peace with Israel. So for a long time, the West said, we don't care. You know, we just want a strong man in that country who will be good for our interests. And it was none other than Condoleezza Rice who you know, accepted that in 2005. She said, you know, for a long time, we preferred stability or democracy. And you know, it, was, uh, it was not good for both. Uh, and I th so I think the region, all, all the, like the uprisings, the Arab Spring in Egypt and Tunis show, has shown that uh, people of this region, like people everywhere in the world, want to be free. They want to be free from a, a government which imposes uh, ideologies. They want to be free from a government which tortures people and which is not, you know, uh, questioning people's uh, addresses, uh, like uh, aspirations. And in the long run, what what will be is that what, what will be good for the region is first of all forcing those countries to liberalize their laws and systems. And secondly, allowing those countries to have better links between them. Because the more closed a society is, the more borders you have, and the more barbed wires you have around its society, the, the, the more the authoritarian state in that society has a grip on its people. And that's why uh, invading Iraq really did not help the Middle East. But giving them Twitter and Facebook helped a lot. So allowing people to go beyond their, you know, barbed wire borders, understanding the world, it being exposed to new ideas has been helpful as in this case. And actually the history shows that, you know, the history between the West and the East shows that uh, peoples in this part of the world have always benefited from peaceful interactions with the West. I mean, think tanks and foundations and schools in this part of the world have always been helpful. That, that helps you know, flourish liberal ideas, democratic ideas in this part of the world. Uh, but on the other hand, invasions and bombings, and they do not help. They do not help. They create more reaction and actually they create the feeling of being under threat. Uh, and also, to add up on that, the uh, peace between Israel and Palestine, that's another important thing. And if it can, they, they cannot be sold. People in this part of the world will th continue to think that you know, the West is uh, against them or not, not you know, caring for their rights or not looking at them in a, in a justice, uh, from a justice perspective. So ultimately, uh, I think uh, this history shows that there is nothing that, uh, that honorable or that, you know, uh, there's nothing about the nation state that we should really take as this, a great ideal. I mean, for a long time people thought the empires were the dark age and the nation states emerged and nation states are the best era. That's the zenith of human history and human evolution. You know. I don't think uh, that is the case. That is a phase in our history. Maybe a few centuries from now people will live in a different structure. Maybe there will be no states. You know. Maybe there will be a more loose states. Then maybe there will be like a more federational structure in the world we can know. That depends on technology and so on. But the nation state, like all other systems before, had its, you know, some strengths, but also had its own important uh, in troubles and problems, especially in this part of the world, which is very diverse ethnically and religiously. The nation state has created maybe sometimes more problems than the blessings it brought. And uh, how to tame the nation state, I think, will be a key question uh, in the years to come. And the indigenous cultures of this region, including Islam, uh, I think will be, a, uh, will be an important tool to work on that question. Because um, in, in traditional Islamic uh, thought, uh, the state is not seen something that you should venerate. The state is not seen something as, you know, as an object of worship, which the nation state has become. It is rather as seen as a tool to uh, ensure that people you know, obey law and order, uh, but you know, as a, to a tool which should be tamed and kept under control. Uh, and I have been working on that, by the way, that's the final point. Uh, and can there be an Islamic argument for liberalism? And 
And my answer is yes, but I don't have time for that uh, right now in this talk. This book, which I, will, I have in two months, coming in July, uh, I address the Muslim case for the there. Well, thank you so much.